Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to see you. It's wonderful to hear you chatting with one another. And I encourage you, let's stand together, if we could, and lift our voices. I long to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I long to tell the story because I know Jesus is true. Tell it, 
I especially like the songs that celebrate, that tell the story of the Christ event that walk through in a lyric that we can sing together, that we can state together, that we can say to one another together, here's what Jesus Christ did. Here is who our God is. This song does exactly that. I encourage you, never waste an opportunity to rehearse the Jesus event. And let's join in right here on the second verse. It says, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. wonderful story in the Gospel of Mark. It's a story of Jesus feeding to the 5,000. And the disciples are exhausted. They're overwhelmed with the needs of the people. And they realize the people have nothing to eat. And so they go to Jesus and they say, please send them away. Jesus said, what do you have? You feed them. They found five loaves and two fish. They gave them to Jesus and he broke it and he multiplied it. And then he said something very interesting. He said, seat the people on the patches of green grass. That phrase has always struck me. Why the green grass? What is the significance of green grass? Throughout scripture, green grass, whether it be in Isaiah or Psalm 23, uh, symbolizes the inbreaking kingdom of God. The green grass got me to thinking about a story of my first visit to Swaziland. We were there with a church group to help work at a clinic and a church and a school. We went to a mission site called Sitsatsawani on the, one of the most remote parts of Swaziland. The, there was no water for a community of 12,000 people. Their fields were dry, they had no crops, their livestock were dying, and, and uh, it, it was just a very broken place. And we were there trying to do what we could, and we were offering what we had. And a, a man that was with us by the name of Fred Evans said, Pastor David, I see a water well across the way. Can I go look at that? And he went and, and checked out that water well. It had been broken down and had not worked for years. And he came back and he said, I believe there's water there. 
And so I remember the time when, as a group, we stood together, we held hands, and we prayed around that water well, and we said, God, we're bringing you what we have, as little as it is. Do something extraordinary here. Fred went home and he developed a solar panel water well system that he uniquely made. And he said, Pastor, we can do this for $25,000. We instantly raised the money and we went back and we installed the very first solar panel water well in Swaziland. One year later, I went back to that place. They said, we want you to go back and see what God has done in Sitsatsawaini. And so I did. I couldn't believe my eyes. There were, uh, was green in all of the pastures. All of the fields were full of crops. Uh, the livestock were back again. There were children running and laughing and playing, and there were hundreds of people there to greet us. The first thing they said to me when I got out of the van was, where is Evans? We want him to see what has happened here. And as I looked at what that fresh water had done in that, in that place that was so broken and so dry and decimated, and I saw new life, and I looked around, and there by the nurse's station was green grass. God's kingdom was breaking in in that moment. But the story isn't over, because the Coca-Cola Foundation found out about that project. They found out about Fred's unique uh, design. They said, can we buy that? And Coca-Cola Foundation committed $1 million to a water project throughout all of Swaziland we said, we want you to start with the 17th Nazarene Clinics. And for the first time, the Nazarene Clinics in Swaziland had fresh running water. Why did that happen? That happened because a man named Fred, a Nazarene in a church in Oklahoma said, Lord, I give you what I have. It's not much compared to the need, but if you'll take what I have and you'll multiply it in your hands, a miracle can happen and thousands of people are affected by that. We praise God for what you are doing through your World Evangelism Fund. Every time you pray, every time you give, every time you, you go, lives are being changed. We do this together. We sometimes don't tell you thank you enough, but today on behalf of a global church where God is working in miraculous ways, we say thank you for giving what you have you may think it's very little, but in the end, placed in the hands of Jesus, it's changing the world. Good morning, everyone. I really like the story, and we as the church um, donate to the World Evangelism Fund, and this just shows you a fraction of what God does with what you give, whether you can give in funds, whether you can give in time and services, whether you can give in prayer. God will use it to the most value, and this story was just, just amazing with me. I needed to share it with you. So thank you for all you do whether we're collecting for alabaster, for Easter offerings, for local charities in the community. I don't know if you understand how many people you reach, and we thank you. I also would like to make a quick announcement. I've had a few people asking me about the pastoral search. I have spoken with the district superintendent and he asked me to announce the vetting process is well underway. He is looking to meet later this month with the board to start the process. So we'll keep you updated. Thanks for asking. I watch that video and I can't help but think of our own local church, how God has blessed us. You're sitting in a building in a facility that's paid for. Not many churches can say that God has blessed us, but it's because of you. You are the church and the offerings that you give 
have been wonderful and blessing. Lord, let's go to prayer for the offering. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for your touch on our lives and everyone in this room. We just ask that your spirit would be with us. Bless this people as they give. Lord, bless it, the board and the church and the decisions and how they spend your money. Lord, be with us. Be with each and every person that our lives come in con contact with. And we'll give you all the praise this morning. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for your grace. You may be seated. Thank you, team. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk and begin to talk over the next few weeks about this idea of go. Go. We're going to hit the uh, Great Commission where uh, Jesus himself gave us our mission and gave us the way that we are going to go uh, and that we are as as part of his body that we're actually to go and we're going to talk about what that looks like but before we can dive more into that over the next few weeks we need to look at and it's in your bulletin this conversation with us and with our creator that we need to kind of come to grips with and the idea of the conversation and we're going to go through it kind of quick but I want you to have that in front of you the idea of the conversation is simply this. All that we have, all that we have, life itself, we owe to our creator. And so we become very independent. We picked up a little bit on this theme last week, and that is uh, we become very independent and feel as though uh, either the world rests on our shoulders or at least our world 
rests on our shoulders and that we are the ones that are accomplishing everything that's being accomplished. So we need to kind of reset as we begin to think about what our creator intended for us, what our mission for our lives and our purpose for our lives are, and we need to build this foundation of this conversation. So let's dive in. Point number one, don't forget that our creator gave us life. The gift of life is a miracle from God. Without life, we aren't even here to consider whether God exists or not. Our initial step of obedience when we think about this idea, each of these points has an initial step of obedience and the fruit or the result of that, that obedience. Our initial step of obedience is simply to be grateful for life and begin to understand its value and to consider the God that gave us life. We couldn't do that. We couldn't even consider God if God hadn't first given us life. Now, the, the fruit of this sort of obedience, the fruit of stepping into this conversation, uh, of looking across the world and saying, there has to be a creator. Something bigger is going on here. Uh, there must be a God. All those thoughts are enabled uh, for us by God, and the fruit of us stepping into that conversation fruit of that obedience is that the spirit begins to prepare the way in us for clearer thoughts about God and who he is the spirit begins to be at work uh, to have a fascination about the beauty of nature is one of the God enabled abilities that we have to see appreciation for the beauty and the intricacy and the majesty. Now here, um, even, even early humans looked around them and said, wow. He said, well, does that mean this is a primitive idea? No, it means it's a base idea. It's a part of our base uh, human being-ness, okay? It is a base idea. And so in Genesis 2-7, uh, then the Lord formed God, um, then Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, this is a pretty big deal, folks. This breath of life wasn't just oxygen. This idea that he breathed into us the breath of life, it's a lot of our realizations, the things that make us unique as human beings, the thing that he delights in as, uh, as having a relationship with him. That was part of the breath of life. It is so much bigger than oxygen. So Genesis 2, 7, continuing, the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted in the garden in the east, in Eden. There he put the man he had formed him. I, the way my mind works, it's a little weird. Uh, this is the first moment that uh, somebody gave somebody directions. <laughs> so I, I don't quite understand it, uh, the earth was just kind of formed and there's directions here you know go east if you want to find the garden I just imagine a guy pulling up at the gas station go you know I'm looking for the garden and the gas station guy goes uh, it's east go east so it's the first directions that we have I don't know what east meant then we have guesses as to where this garden was but here it is in Genesis 2 7 and that's where he put man Psalms 139 says for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Like 300 years later, a prophet picked up on this theme, was talking to God, and this is the message that the prophet delivered on behalf of God. Jeremiah said in one, chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Our creator, 1 Timothy, our creator, Paul says this, 
uh, gives life to all things, you and me included. Now, another thing he gives us, the next part of the conversation, is talent. He gives us talent. And this, you know, didn't just start. And talents have gotten in this day and age a lot more diverse and complicated. But he still gives talents that meet the culture and meet this time of man's development. But here we go back a ways. And we, uh, God gave talents and other unique traits to each of us. The corrupt world may have diminished some of this, but everything that is good in you is part of the God image. Everything that is good in you is a part of the God image. It's in these abilities that we take into the marketplace, and we trade these abilities for a paycheck or for ways to build a life, to sustain our family. God provided those talents and those abilities. So our obedience in this case is to say yes to the gifts that God gave us, to embrace the way he put us together, not fight against it. And also then to use them productively for the good of our families and for the good of others. The fruit of this kind of obedience is to see how God uses someone like us to impact others. So you saw in the video, it's a great example. A uh, little something we do, maybe giving an offering or giving a little extra or giving to world missions, uh, that has an, in, uh, an ability then to have an impact on somebody else and doesn't massively change their lives. And doesn't that kind of blow your mind that God gave you the opportunity to participate with him at that level, to have a front row seat to how he plans to have an impact on the world, and you're a part of it, I'm a part of it. That should blow your mind. A scriptural example of this is in Exodus, Exodus 35, around about uh, verse 30. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Beze Beze this is why I don't do Old Testament, Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, and I assume him, um, and the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship. To devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, for the work of every skilled craft. God gave that. God placed that in you and me. And he was, has inspired him to teach, in, and this is key, both him and Oliab uh, uh, Ahimach, the tribe of Dan. Now there's a simple one, Dan. I like Dan. And he has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. So not only did he give the skills and the craft and this talent but then he enabled these people to teach and to pass this on and to enable others who have similar gifts and abilities then to uh, step in to how God had made them. And it's a fascinating process that we see here, but it's all part of that conversation we have that everything we are has been created in us by God. Dream. Your ability to think and perceive things that aren't material in nature is an ability that God gave you. It is one of his favorite abilities, I believe. Without it, we can't do really much at all. So anything that you go to produce or create, anything that you go to say, I'm going to, uh, whether it's build a house, I'm going to build a birdhouse, or uh, I'm going to create a team or any of that, is first built in our minds first built in our minds so there are two creations first creation is what we imagine needs to be built the second creation is actually building it and i'm not sure we could do the second creation i don't see how that would be possible if we didn't have the first creation so that is a unique ability that god has given us to think about and envision how we go about being productive in our lives how we go about making something happen we see it here first unique ability and then we go about creating what we have seen 
the obedient response in stepping into this ability that God has given us is to use it to consider and to seek God. Well, what's that mean? Well, that means um, since uh, I, I can't see God directly, because actually no man can see God and, and survive, but since I can't see God directly, since I can't go up and necessarily shake his hand, my relationship with him is in this brain that he has enabled us to see things like the first creation of two creations. And so it's in that imagination that we can begin to see how God is speaking to us. It's that same ability to see things that are there but aren't physically there. He gave you and me that ability. That's the way we can have a relationship with him. That was an important key part that sets us apart as human beings from all else. So when you dream, when you, when you think about what can be, when you, even, even um, when you dream or daydream at, during the day or sleep at night, step into that ability and use that ability to consider and seek God. That's obedience. The fruit of that obedience is actually, the Bible tells us, the beginning of truth and wisdom, our understanding of truth and wisdom. So um, in Acts 2, it says this, but this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel, quoting scripture, Acts 2. In the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So as we connect with who God is, dreams will start to settle in. A vision of what can be will start to settle in. That is part of the first creation that takes place here. And then the second creation is God's power enabling us to actually make it happen. Okay, next part of the conversation. Drawing. God gives us everything that we are. And one of the things he does to involve himself in our lives to be with us moment by moment, is sending his spirit to do a very important task. The Holy Spirit will influence us to draw close to God, even though we can ignore it, the Holy Spirit is always at work doing this, regardless of how long we've been a follower of Christ. He is drawing us closer and closer and closer. That is the act and activity of the Holy Spirit. So what's that look like even in a maturing Christian's life? In a maturing Christian's life, we will go through seasons of time. And it will be marked either by a crisis or it could be marked by uh, prosperity. It could be marked by whatever. But during those seasons, it is God's intent through the power of his Holy Spirit to emerge from that season closer to him and he closer to us than ever before. Does that make sense? What kind of a season are you in right now? What kind of season is it? And so what, it, what defines your life right now? And define that season. Because nothing about life just is always like that forever. There are ebbs and flows. And there, is these, there are these moments that define seasons. What season are you in right now? Because the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. Drawing you. So that at the end of whatever the season is, you will be closer to him than ever before. That's his intent. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It is God's intent that we exit all seasons of life closer to him than when we entered that season. So how are we obedient in the drawing part? We are obedient in responding to God's call to come closer by, you know, coming closer. The closer we are, the more and more evident our journey with him becomes the more and more evident him living in and through us becomes and the more evident that is the more he draws it doesn't stop the holy spirit will not stop drawing us closer and closer to him the fruit of this uh you know the fruit is the patience and self-control needed to be disciplined in a lifestyle that is pursuing god how do I know that's fruit? Well, the Bible tells us, but I know me. And I know I'm not characterized by patience. And so that has to be the work of the Holy Spirit in me, enabling me 
to lead a lifestyle that not only continues to help me pursue God, but those around me. That has to be from God. It's not me. John 6 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, the disciples grumbled about this just a little bit. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? By the way, I think this is kind of funny because that's kind of going to be what happens. They'll watch him go up and disappear into the heavens. Then the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one would come to me unless the Father has enabled them. So here's the end game. The end game that he's after is, I want my spirit to live in and through you. I'm going to draw you. I'm going to create you. I'm going to give you gifts and talents. And my whole design of life is for you to draw closer and closer to me in relationship. Are you up for it? And John says, no one can come to me unless the Father. He's drawing all of us. All of us, all the time. The Spirit living in us is Jesus' in game when he's with the disciples preparing to ascend into heaven. Brand new. This part of the conversation. If you are in a saving relationship with Jesus, then you are a new creation. And we rejoice about that. If you remember the moment that you accepted Jesus and his spirit flooded in and things in you begin to change that there was no way that you could change on your own, you go, wow. And you realize the idea of this new creation. It's amazing. It blows your mind. Things happen in my life, in your life, that there's no way we could do humanly on our own. But it begins to happen as the spirit comes in and begins to work on us. Now, pro tip. That doesn't stop. So whatever the new creation is, he continues to make us anew. And one of the reasons that needs to be done is there's nothing about our lives that stay the same, especially since we age. Maybe that's why God has us age. I don't know. But my 20s decade was very different than my 30s decade. And my 30s decade was very different than my 40s decade. And my 50s decade, which I'm in now just so you know, is very different than those decades. And so, not only did he make me new, but I want his spirit to live in me so that whatever the 60s decade looks like, and some of you can tell me about that, whatever the 60s decade looks like, or the 70s decade, or the next one, whatever those decades look like, he's going to continue to make me into a new creation so that I'm ready for what's coming next. He doesn't say, boom, you're a new creation, I'll see you in a, you know, 50 years. That's not how it works. So why do I owe everything to God? Because his new creation work doesn't stop once I fully realize who he is. He's continuing, continuing to make me into a new creation. Brand new. So what's the key step of obedience here? It's It's to continually be open to the Holy Spirit remaking you aware that he is at your core guiding you it isn't time to necessarily relax say oh this is not how the rest of your life will be there will be more seasons there will be different things coming on the horizon the inner fruit of being open to who uh, how God wants to make you into a new creation the inward fruit of that is a deep gratitude a humility an unmistakable joy from not only being forgiven but for continually being made new I, I, I think back on some of my life and I think back on some of the seasons and did you ever get a season those of you that have matured in Christ over the years you ever get a season just in time a season that taught you something a season that uh, deepened your faith in Christ and then the next decade or whatever happens and you realize how important that season was. And you realize how important it was that God was actively making you into a new creation. He knew what was coming. 
And he wasn't going to just let you walk into that without having the preparation that he designed for you. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave the ministry of reconciliation. That can blow your mind if you think about it. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us, entrusting to you, to me, this message of reconciliation. Wow. Brand new. We can made, be made into new creations. You know, um, I lost count of how many times America has saved France, but uh, I'm sorry if that, anybody of French descent, I apologize if that's offensive. <laughs> 1860 they helped us out they did they, they helped us out we talked about that last week 1860 uh, some insect came through France and decimated not the core of their grapevines but decimated the, the vines in general okay the vine and the ground survived but not much else and without the leaves and the branches you know it didn't look good for the wine industry in France and America responded so uh, our grape industry began to cut off or prune branches and figure out how to put them together so they would survive and ship them over to France. And what did they do with them? They tenderly began to graft them in to the, to the vine, grafting them in. A whole new species, so to speak, of vine began to grow. Those branches that were once dead from uh, America being cut off begin to flourish, and the vineyards begin to come back to life. A new creation because they were attached to the power source, to the nutrition, to the nutrients in the soil, and it began to flourish. The green, once again, like we saw in the video. That's God's intent for being a new creation. Let me graft you into the power source. Let me graft you into my family. Let me graft you into my inheritance so that you can grow and flourish and produce fruit. Another part of the conversation is influence. Influence. Part of being a new creation is that you are now more and more easily influenced by the Holy Spirit. This is a good thing. As you mature and exercise more and more surrender, the Holy Spirit has more and more direct influence over your thinking, over your heart, over your reacting, and over your dreaming. What the Holy Spirit influences you to do results in doing things of eternal, eternal impact. So here's the step of obedience here. It's allowing God to influence the things that you do, the things that you value, in order to step into God's purpose for your life. Allow his life to flow through you, changing the things you think, changing the things you do. The fruit here is deep love for others that respond more quickly. You re begin to respond more and more quickly to God's leading. That's the fruit. And there's an influence that begins to take place not only is the holy spirit influencing you but that simple fact that you're being influenced by the holy spirit directly heart to heart mind to mind life to life creates an influence in you out into others your community the more the more christians that are connected to the vine that are flourishing in the holy spirit your community is positively impacted by the influence of the holy spirit through that remember mature christians rarely are tempted to simply do nothing here's a key thought but they are often tempted to do things that are actually nothing you want to do something you can only do it through your creator you can only do it through the power of the holy spirit if you want to do something that's positive that has uh, eternal impact it can only be done through the influence and the infilling of the Holy Spirit out into your community. Our step of obedience here is being willing to embrace being uncomfortable 
for the rest of our lives. Ah, that sounds exciting. Being uncomfortable for the rest of our lives. Why? Embrace the different and the differences. The less you are obedient in embracing the discomfort, the fewer and fewer opportunities God will have to use you. So let's say you take stock in your life. You know, here's the kind of person I am. And let's say I've been following Christ for 40 years or so. Okay, here's the kind of person I am and that I've become. Great. How many people like that, exactly like you are, does God need you to influence on his behalf? Well, if they're exactly like me, they have a relationship with Christ. And they have a maturing, deep, and growing relationship with Christ. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So how many people that are just exactly like you are don't have that relationship? Well, there's fewer and fewer people that God can use you to impact. Unless, unless you're willing to be uncomfortable with people that are different from you, the people that aren't like you, the people maybe that make you a little nervous. So the conversation about why is it I can do nothing without God, one of the answers is because we can't do eternal somethings. All we can do are nothings. One of the questions one of my former pastors would ask, he would say, a hundred years from now, a hundred years from now, how important is what you think is important right now going to be? How important a hundred years from now? Because you're going to be, you know, you won't be on earth, but a hundred years from now, you will still be watching what's going on. You'll still somehow be a part of something. So how important a hundred years from now is what you think is important now going to be? How's that inform your decisions? You know, I have a hundred extra bucks. How do I spend a hundred extra bucks for eternal somethings? Not for a nothing. How, how, who do I connect with this week and just have a conversation and just let God flow out of me or just be a friend? No big, you know, agenda. So where do I invest that friendliness? Where do I invest that love for neighbor that a hundred years from now is going to be a win? Should inform our decisions. This part of the conversation with our God and Father. The fruit here is characterized by a lack of condemnation and a willingness to forgive and a willingness, like it said in the scripture, we have the message of reconciliation, a willingness to deliver a message of immense hope. Immense hope. Mark chapter 6, 7 through 13. Jesus, he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, giving them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, but to wear sandals and only put on one tunic. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. If, and I'm not sure how you don't do that, but and okay, when, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. Meaning, stay in one spot in the town where people can find you. And if any place will not receive you, they will not and will not listen to you, then shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out two by two and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and they healed them. That's an amazing thought. Colossians, Jesus, in Colossians 1, Jesus says, Jesus, uh, actually, uh, it's not Jesus talking about Jesus. Jesus, we proclaim. Jesus is who we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, for this I struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works in and through me. So that's the conversation. Before we can consider what go looks like in the Great Commission, before we consider when he says, go ye into all the world, making disciples, we each individually 
have to have this conversation with God. This has to be the foundation for which when we go, something eternal is done. Doing something eternal as opposed to doing something that ends up being nothing. It's my prayer that God be clear enough that God be clear enough in me that the things I do are so synced up with who he is that what I do is something and produces something eternal and not something that's nothing. So here's my challenge for you this week. This week, ask yourself, why has God enabled me to live? And what is his purpose for my life? And how is he going to fulfill it if I'm willing? Let's stand together for a moment, shall we? Uh, from the last few weeks, you have, from the bottom of the bulletin, a, ch a place where you were able to write down two names and two names, a total of four. Two names of folks that may be far from Christ but are close to you, and two names of folks that may be far from Christ and may be not so close to you that you think um, God might want to have an impact on. And you're just going to pray for them. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what God's going to do twice a day. I hope you're doing okay in that commitment, and if you need to, double down again. Recommit yourself to say, you know, I didn't do so good last week. I'm going to talk to God about these four people twice a day. Because I want God's influence, even if it's just in prayer, to flow through me. I want to do something eternal. So I encourage you to continue on that. Let's pray together, shall we? Dear Lord, over these next few moments and over these next few weeks we look forward to what it is that you're going to say to us as we not only look at our own lives as we look at our church the body of Christ but also as we look at our community and the impact that you are longing to have one of the ways you draw us to you is through other people who are filled with your spirit. May we be those people, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing this chorus together. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus, because he first loved me. You may be seated. I have a few announcements and I'm going to bring you a report uh, on the process. Uh, first of all, the Women's Grove meeting. That's women's ministry. The Women's Grove meeting is July 22nd in Cadillac City Park. You're going to meet in between the, that black locomotive steam engine and the fountain somewhere in there so you want to go and gather uh, together bring a lunch or something with you bring a, a lawn chair that would be helpful and um, invite a friend bring somebody with you and uh, not a huge agenda for that just come and uh, enjoy some time together and chat uh, they'll talk about uh, some things for the future there's a fellowship dinner this Saturday night if you haven't signed up yet uh, you can sign up and let, let us know if you're bringing something and that would be great. And we're going to tell stories from the history of Cherry Grove. So uh, that'll be Saturday night. We'll gather together. We'll spend some great time together. We'll have some conversation. We'll have some great food. And we'll hang out. And we'll tell a few stories about the history of Cherry Grove and what God has done here in the past. Uh, I encourage you to do something eternal. Not, don't, don't do nothing, but do something that's eternal. And that is sign up for Vacation Bible School to help volunteer and to work. That'll be a blast. You'll be uh, working with other folks. It'll be fun. We'll be uh, doing something for the kids that bring them along in their spiritual journey. So many times, those moments have lifelong impact, eternal consequences for the good. And I encourage you to sign up for Vacation Bible School. And uh, those are also at the welcome desk as well. Oh, by the way, there's a 
there is a meeting. If you haven't been to a vacation Bible school volunteer meeting yet, there's one right down the hallway on this side uh, immediately after service so for about 20, 15 or 20 minutes. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and that we're going to be, uh, Tom asked, we're going to be doing some um, painting on the outside of the church. And so if you would like to, to I, I, painting doesn't look like it should be that difficult. Okay, it really doesn't. But when I do it, everything gets painted, including myself. And so, uh, but anyway, if you're willing to paint uh, and, and can paint, that would be wonderful. Uh, you may not think it's a gift, but I do because I can't do it. Um, so uh, see Tom, he's right over here, and, or contact the church office to volunteer if you uh, don't know how to get a hold of Tom, and we'll put you in touch. All right, let me take a drink of water here. So here is um, a report. I'm going to read it to you. And it uh, talks about where we're at <clears throat> in the process uh, that I am here for. And that's the process. Was, was, uh, there were some multiple dynamics to it. Uh, but I am here as we begin to turn the corner and what it looks like to get ready for the future. And the future includes a new pastor. And there's a process in how all that comes together. So let me give you uh, the report of what's uh, taken place to date. This is just a sample. There are actually monthly reports that are a lot more detailed, but that would be boring. So here we go. <laughs> uh, from January until now, leadership has been working simultaneously on about a threefold approach. Uh, first of all, is healing from a sudden pastoral change and from the chaos that COVID created. The church board thought it might be wise that if somebody is still struggling mentally or emotionally with anything from 2020, any of those things that caused uh, stress, you can confidentially then call the church office and Patty or myself will set up an appointment and that could be with me if you wanted to meet with me or if you're uncomfortable meeting with me, that is fine. We can line up an appointment with somebody else uh, that was here during that time, another church leader to make an appointment with you. And we'll all do that discreetly through the church office. Many meetings with folks have already taken place in January and February especially, but sometimes still continued into March and April. COVID still has crippled us to some extent. It's more after effects than direct now. But we're working to come back from the losses of 2020. Healing was necessary in order to move forward with our future with a healthy outlook. Let me explain what that means, just briefly. When you're not in your best condition, you don't make your best decisions. I don't know if you've noticed that personally. When I'm not in my best condition, I don't make my best decisions. And so we spent some time, we started, I don't know if you recall, it's in the report, talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in January and February. And the goal was to become in the, uh, in the best condition we possibly could as we entered a season that would begin to include making some decisions. At the same time, that process of, of healing was going on. Simultaneously, we began to see what ministries we could reestablish. Worship planning, worship rehearsals, spiritual communication includes like the weekly follow-up videos, the invite videos, bulletins. Uh, those things have uh, been put back into the process. Nursery, Kids Grove up through about sixth grade, Wednesday night Bible study, which I don't think that was down for long. You kept that going, I think, for quite a while. And, um, and then eventually our first big event, and that was the Father's Day banquet, our first official one, if you, if you don't count, Easter breakfast. And other ministries rose in priority during this time because of the impact that COVID has had, such as following up on our shut-ins and our independent elderly folks. That ministry is still in development. But uh, Dorothy, there she is. Dorothy has been working on that. Some of that was just finding out who our folks were as part of the data, uh, gathering the database process. And we haven't, I haven't talked with Dorothy about this yet, but our, our first meeting as we begin to go through and meet with those folks that, uh, whether I met with them before or not, will, will probably be about a week from Monday. And Dorothy will keep in constant contact with them. That's something that's new or different, but seemed to be needed. 
coming out of COVID. So many of these efforts required information. The database was established and populated uh, so that we know who and where we are. It will serve as a point of communication soon, and, have a, and we have established a system to more easily schedule volunteers and plan weekend events, plan events, plan the weekend ministries and other ministries. The church calendar is now centralized, and we're working on how best to communicate that beyond just the core group of leaders. The trustee committee had a, a work day not long ago. We celebrated that. They continue, by the way, to have work days. Uh, that hasn't stopped. They're still going. Things are happening. Uh, they seek to beautify this property even more, making it more noticeable from the main road. This included a power washing just last week. Do you feel better? I feel better when everything's kind of, you know. So they, they worked on that. They're continuing to work on other things. And as Tom mentioned, uh, we could even use more volunteers. It'll go faster the more hands that we have. We have rearranged some of our rooms to provide workspace for leaders and volunteers that have stepped up. As life has returned, uh, so have many returned to church, but not all. The Easter weekend created some momentum, and we have gone from uh, some occasional Sundays in the 60s uh, to averaging over 100 regularly. A recent Sunday, we had 133. This does not include folks that continue to watch online, and that runs between 10 and 20 or so that are not necessarily in the count but we watch that and we track that the worship team rehearses and prepares for sunday so does the tech team who also work to send the services out live so that others can watch those the crowd the part of our congregation that is watching online and then they archive them so that the services can be experienced throughout the week and later this is a huge deal especially coming from what we're coming from Kids Grove is picking up momentum. Their leader, Tony Oswalt, and her leaders are gearing up for Vacation Bible School. This is also a big deal. They need you, by the way. I know I've said that. I'm going to keep saying it. It is great to see the kids' numbers coming back as this team has made sure that there is consistency and quality in the Kids Grove experience. Folks have worked to keep the facility clean, maintained, and more than that, even improved. Greeters at the doors continue. The schedule has been circulated. We are here. The lights are on. And I hope you've noticed of the things that I've mentioned, this is volunteer-driven. This is Cherry Grove doing this, with the exception of some part-time hours. By the way, Patty Weatherwax is our church secretary uh, for the last few months. She's done a, a great job, and a lot of those systems are behind the scenes that she's been working to document and keep uh, things going in ways that keep the business part of the church intact. But the majority of this has been accomplished through leaders and teams from Cherry Grove volunteers. You, you are doing this. Each of us has a calling. Each of us are gifted in a certain way that God plans for us to contribute to the community. God is using the people of Cherry Grove to come back strong. Many of you continue to give tithes and offerings and sometimes special sacrificial gifts. The church board has established, by the way, an emergency fund. What's that for? Well, it's for emergencies. It's an emergency fund. But it's money that's set aside so that about two months of operation if, um, can be provided for in the case of uh, another emergency like COVID or very different. And then we separate that in a very healthy way than from our operating fund. The operating fund, I'm happy to announce, is in the black. That means good, if, if you don't know the difference between red and black in, in the checkbook. It's positive. The only way we were able to do that, the only way that we will be able to minister in the ways we are planning through the summer is because you've been faithful. Because as part of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you continue to give to the body of Christ. The prayer chain of the prayer team have been actively calling on God for focus and for energy, but most of all, we spent, as I mentioned before, January and February calling on God for his presence, calling on the name of Jesus above all else. Nothing can be more important than his presence. Seeking Jesus first above all else is how Cherry Grove can and will continue to move forward.
And finally, I encourage you to see the people outside of these doors. See the people of Cherry Grove and Cadillac communities the way Jesus wants us to see them. If God lays someone on your heart, call them. Just offer friendship. Or maybe invite them to church. That would be great too. This is a great place to be. So sure, invite your friends and your neighbors. But more than anything, just engage. Check in on them. See how they're doing. And allow the influence of the Holy Spirit that is in you to begin to influence them. And finally, we worked the assessment through as many of the congregation as we possibly could in January and February. Then the assessment came back. Lonnie came in and did the presentation on Wednesday night meeting. We put a team together that will work on the highlighted areas. The church board and the transition team meet together to begin, uh, have already met together to begin to dream of the future. We captured that information. The purpose of this was to identify common visions and to identify common values that Jesus dreaming through you has produced. Why is that so important? Well, common values and common vision is needed to address most of the areas of concern that came up in the assessment. And while addressing each of these areas has already begun to some extent, for the gains to continue, more people need to be involved. And this team and the board need to agree on what this church will look like, not in super great detail, but in God-given vision for what the church will look like in three years from now and five years from now. This common vision is what gives us the ability to empower leaders and for us to all move in the same direction direction depending on how quickly the transition team is able to address the task before them it seems as though we will be at a starting point for a pastoral profile very soon hopefully before september the profile will be completed this isn't a light task cherry grove has a unique personality has god-given strengths values that are ingrained deep in the heart of our people and a strong love for one another. God has a plan. Experience tells us that there is a fit out there for a pastor and for Cherry Grove. And that when those two get together, it will be a win-win. Cherry Grove will be a better place, and that minister will be a better minister. We will use all the tools at our disposal to provide the DS and the church board the best possible view of the future at that point then the search will begin in earnest there's so much more behind the scenes to report but that gives you a taste of where we are i encourage any of you you can call me at any time uh, leave a message here at the church office if i'm not here and we will i will get back to you ask any questions that you're interested in and we will talk about what is happening to the best of our ability uh, to answer your questions please continue to pray that the holy spirit speak to each of us as individual followers and as a group a community of believers here in cherry grove i submit that as your report if you have any questions please let me know pray daily for your church amen let's stand together And that's it for today. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Appreciate your prayers, uh, your prayer of support, and your prayer for your uh, community and for this body of believers. You are dismissed. Go in the name of Christ.